it's my pleasure um, to, uh, to provide you with our next speaker's bio here. I'll uh, be as brief as I can. Kevin Popovich, yes? Yes. Um, communications Director at Idea House. And Kevin is the founder of Idea House, an award-winning creative communications agency, helping its clients figure out what to say and how to say it to build brands and increase sales. Mr. Kevin, Mr. Monetization. Um, with more than 30 years experience, he helps make smart decisions about all types of business communications and demonstrates how to best utilize resources to generate return on each investment. As an academic, Mr. Popovich earned a BA in communications and psychology, a MS in multimedia technology, and a focused doctoral studies within instructional technologies, my my. He has taught creative and communications to undergraduate, graduate, and continuing education, as well as developed and delivered corporate training for Fortune 500 companies. We are in good company this morning. Um, some uh, actually well published indeed as well. I just uh, received a book last night myself. Um, but some of the things he's published, Attitudes on the Use of Social Media and Healthcare Communications, uh, Tweeting at Dr. Webby, Practical Examples of Social Media in Healthcare. Hold on, hold on, I'm turning the page. Uh, 20 Years Communications, 20 Years uh, Leaders, 20 Questions, uh, Hundreds of Lessons. That was the book I received last night, actually. And uh, in closing, I will tell you, Kevin, uh, in 2014, this year, has been named the top 40 digital strategists in marketing by Online Marketing Institute. We are very pleased to have him here with us this Thank morning. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hey. Good morning. Thank you for the, uh, the nice warm-up, Stefan. Uh, I hope everybody had a little bit of coffee, a little bit of something to eat. You warmed up now after uh, uh, our first presenter and uh, ready for um, what I, I hope to be a very lively conversation. Um, I've never liked just being the talking head uh, in the front of a classroom uh, nor an audience. So uh, I am here to help facilitate our collective conversation about content marketing. Doesn't that sound a little more fun than just watching another guy talk for an hour this morning? Yeah. yeah. Yes, <laughs> there you go. Reach under the sugar, the caffeine. I'm sure it's going to come up here uh, uh, in just a moment. Okay, um, so uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, my generous introduction. Um, we were joking about the, the intros last night, right? You about, have earned it. Yeah. Right? Well, <laughs> you know, um, uh, and the, the reason that I, I try to provide um, scope is, is for context, right? Who's the guy up here telling me I should do something different with my company? Um, so please take that um, as the purpose uh, for that. Um, it's a, uh, I don't consider myself uh, an expert. I consider myself experienced. Um, you all have experiences, and today we're going to share those experiences. Um, so I'm going to lead you through uh, my presentation with quite a number of examples as a case study of what we did for one of our clients uh, uh, to use content marketing as a strategy. Um, not, uh, and that means that there's a purpose behind it, not just um, throwing content uh, on the wall and seeing what sticks. Okay? So... Um, I am the communications director for Idea House. Um, I've had my agency for 24 years, and we have worked for quite a number of companies in a number of verticals. Um, we help our clients figure out what to say and how to say it, which uh, Stefan has alluded to, sometimes can be very difficult, um, uh, whether it is in uh, getting approval for your message or whether you're identifying a message that resonates with your audience to reach that purpose. Um, that's what we help our clients uh, do. Um, what we're going to talk today about is what makes good content for one of our clients, Dr. Wayne Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson uh, studied at the University of Florida, uh, University of Health Sciences in Kansas City, interned, interned at Grandview Hospital, trained in open heart surgery in Cleveland Clinic, Jackson Memorial Hospital at the University of Miami, was the 10th board physician certified in critical care, had 18 years director of surgical care uh, program at Grandview, and was the chairman of the Department of Anesthesiology. So, my guy's not a slacker. He's got some street cred. 
right? After all of this, he walks away from his practice. Now, why would a guy do that, right? And it was voluntary, so let's clarify that. Why does somebody walk away from all this? Restrictions. Sorry? Uh, too many restrictions, red, um, red tape. Uh, that uh, that is, was one. Uh, any other, any ideas why? Maybe he achieved all his goals within the medical profession. Yeah, and um, it's actually, it was just exactly the opposite. He wasn't able to achieve his goals. He went through all of this education. He wasn't able to make a change. Uh, and that was his purpose. He wanted to make a change. He wanted to have an impact. Um, and he wasn't. So in 2000, Dr. Anderson walked away from all of this because he wanted to go and make a difference. All right. So this is our Dr. Anderson. So um, when I had met Dr. Anderson uh, at an event, uh, we started about, uh, talked about starting to work together. I said, let's see what you got. Right. I want to know what is our starting position. So we had this picture. We had his book, Dr. A's Habits of Health. So he had taken everything he'd learned, developed a methodology, um, had uh, quite a lot of thinking about it. Um, there was exercises, there was information. This is all of his applied knowledge on his first book. And as a first-time author does, right, there is some branding that comes along with it. Uh, there is uh, that obligatory email footer. right? You uh, uh, create some email marketing that takes content from the book distributes it on a regular basis and kind of feeds it out, right? It's a little piece, a little thought of the day um, that users subscribe to, uh, and he continued his branding um, on his email communication. He also created a website, right? Habits of Health website, um, all of which, uh, again, talked uh, bits about the book, but was more focused on selling books than um, sharing a message uh, or creating a conversation. Now, Dr. Anderson did do quite a number of presentations uh, at different levels. Uh, this is one of him doing, uh, I believe it was in Los Angeles. And then um, he actually uh, was able to even get some time on Good Morning America, where they brought him in as a subject matter expert on back-to-school nutrition tips. So all of this is what we started with when we started working with Dr. Anderson. Okay. Now, um, at this point, um, we needed to start with um, trying to do some a bit of an assessment, right? And this is the hard part in starting with the new client. Um, I was joking around last night with Tori that, you know, one of the hardest parts in working with a client is telling them which one of his kids is ugly, okay? And so, uh, and, and, and we use that a bit as a bit of a metaphor, right? That's a hard conversation to have. Um, and it's, especially it's a hard conversation when it's yours. Right? Uh, I've got two lovely daughters. I couldn't imagine trying to decide you know, which one was more attractive or more beautiful or anything else. But this was a conversation that we had to have with Dr. Anderson. So let's, uh, this is the audience participation portion of uh, uh, this first part. Uh, on the content that you have seen, what assumptions can we make about Dr. Anderson? Right. What is your impression of Dr. Anderson so far? It's kind of me too. Sorry? It's kind of me too. Kind of me too? Can you expand a little bit on it? Well, I didn't see anything in what you showed that would differentiate him from any number of experts. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed pretty generic. Anyone else? Please, the good doctor isn't here, and he's heard all this from me <laughs> directly, and uh, I promise I won't tell him what you have to say. Please. Um, you don't usually see anesthesiologists um, on a stage talking about anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's both unique and Okay. Anyone else? Please. He's a bit self-centered. I mean, everything he's talking about is him and not what he's trying to do and change. Okay. Please. He's just another doctor trying to make money off patients. Very interesting. Any other comments? Okay. So, local, uh, regional, national, right, as we try to scale him from what you've seen so far, where does he fit on the, on the meter? Is he, a, is he a national player? No. Okay. So what are your expectations based on what you've seen of his content? Right? If you see an article that is published from what you've seen so far, are you likely to read that article? Are you likely to engage with that doctor unless there's a problem with directly related to you? Probably not. 
right? So this was the hard conversation that we had to have with our client when we get started. You just can't go in there and say, wow, it's really great to meet you, we really look forward to working with you. Yes, everything you've done is awesome. No, everything you haven't done is awesome. That's why you're talking to my agency. That's why we're here to help. And this is one of the hardest parts to get started. You have to be very frank about what you see and then what you see the opportunities are, right? Because what we really have to do is we're gonna have to create perception, right? The doctor had a lot of great content. Um, I think that it was just, um, I think that we could uh, help him uh, tell a better story as, as Stefan had, had alluded. Right, so we start with the goals, right? Our big goals for Dr. Anderson, create a communications platform. Right now he had a book and a book site. Uh, and he had a, a building email list when somebody else uh, uh, would subscribe to it, but it really wasn't what we would call a communications platform. We needed to develop a national brand. We needed something that when the doctor and his content was perceived, uh, it was perceived in such a way where people listened, they paid attention to him, where he wasn't just another doctor with a book. Right? And last, we needed to generate new opportunities for Dr. Anderson. Right? He had uh, generated some good opportunities with himself. He was even able to initiate a relationship uh, with Metafast um, uh, through a partnership. And they founded Take Shape for Life, which is the services division of a company, uh, of, the, of that company. Right? So uh, those are familiar with Metafast? Right? Metafast is a company based in uh, Baltimore, they're in the mill replacement business, uh, and they, their product is mill replacements. Um, the services portion of their business um, is their sales team. Right? It's called Take Shape for Life, and they're able to provide health coaches for people who need a health coach. So there's the product side of the business, there's the uh, services side of the business, and Dr. Anderson was um, instrumental in founding the services portion of the business. Right? There was this marriage between his methodology and his habits of health and this book how to do it, and a services team that was going out to try and help people. And it differentiates the difference between a sales call and a help call, right? Their, their intent was to go out and help people. The byproduct of that would be sales, but they weren't going out to sell product. You understand the difference between the two? I think sometimes that's very different, uh, difficult for a company to understand the difference between a sales call and a help call. We'll talk more about that as we talk about building engagement. So. First thing we had to do was get some good pictures of the good doctor, right? And he has this wonderful personality. Dr. Anderson is very knowledgeable. He presents wonderfully on stage. He develops a great rapport. None of the pictures that we had demonstrate that, right? It's, it, it was the obligatory uh, author bio shot. And uh, we, had, uh, we used to joke we had two pictures of the doc, one in uh, uh, a lab coat and one in out without a lab coat. And those were our two in marketing which as you can imagine, uh, gets a little challenging when you're trying to keep it fresh and interesting and engaging. Um, but uh, uh, it really wasn't, uh, in the past, it, it was never about the doctor, even though it was about his book. So we created some pictures that really kind of demonstrates his personality and, and him as a person, so that when he shared his empathetic messages from the heart, that it looked like those messages resonated with the visual of the person that you saw, that the two things go together. That message could come from this person. So uh, that was the first thing that we had done. The second thing <clears throat> that we had done was really realizing that we needed to brand the doctor, right? Instead of just um, taking what he had had already based around the book, now it wasn't based around the book anymore. It was based around the doctor. The doctor was really our product at this portion. Uh, his content, uh, his subject matter expertise would come along with that, right? So we developed a brand. Right. The logo, uh, very simple. Um, in doing our research with Dr. Anderson's audience, we, for, we found that they um, uh, refer to him as Dr. A. All right? And even from his book, his Dr. A's Habits of Health, the title came from the affinity his uh, audience and the people he worked with had from. Like, hey, Dr. A. Like, hey, everybody. Something like that. It's a very poor impersonation of my client. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> it, it was very, very familiar. Right? And, uh, and that was one of the other things that we noticed with him is that every time he had an interaction, almost everybody who had been uh, either a, a, a reader uh, or, or a client and had to work with him, um, there was a, he, they were hugging like all the time, like, hey, how are you? you know, and, and at first, I, I was a little taken aback because most doctors, as we see, you know, aren't the huggy type, 
right? They're like, well, they're nice, it's Michu, yes, doctor this, doctor that, right? Um, but there was something different in this, in that uh, I noticed that in that physical engagement, I wonder how we could uh, turn that into our communications engagement, right? Take the social capital that you had in the personal relationships and leverage it for our marketing communications. So, right, so um, in, in designing this brand, um, it was purposeful in the color selection because in Dr. Anderson's teaching, he talks about the habits of health and assigns the color green to it, and then he has uh, habits of disease, which is red. Right, so we figured, well, how could we work those into it? So, uh, and then we had the, the, the dark gray as kind of a medium color, nice uh, bold font that works um, very, very, very small when it has to be a little icon or a, a God forbid, you have to do a little favicon. Anybody know what a favicon is? Right, the, you know, I think it's like a 20 by 20 pixel on the top of your web browser that shows you the site that you're on. Right, we think about how that brand is gonna, or what icon is gonna work in the smallest of applications. And then when it's giant and it's on a huge 20-foot screen behind him, how is that going to play out as well? So the simplicity of it is intentional, as is the color. And uh, the art accent off the right, a little EKG pulse, right, which a sign that the color is meant to, uh, to intend good health that we've applied to other things. So um, the, the third thing we did was how to rebuild his website. So... We took this brand, we took these new photos that we showed the doctor, and we built out a website that was going to much better present him as not only a subject matter expert, but as a national brand. So um, we have uh, the banners across the top, brought some poppy color. Um, we did go through our information architecture, Stefan, and uh, uh, I'm happy to report we were not formulaic uh, in, uh, and after the fact. But I, uh, I completely understand uh, uh, your, your comments about that. That is a trap that you can get into. You go through the obligatory, what are you going to do on the website? About products, services, books, contact us. There's all those compulsories. Um, but we did make sure that there was things that made the doctor unique. Right? And then we would be remiss if we didn't interject his books, which we did. And then also, if we didn't make sure that people could get it, get to it on no matter which device that they were using. So uh, a full responsive website is compulsory anymore. Um, with the uptick in how many people are using mobile, if your website looks poor on a phone, um, you are going to penalize those people who cared enough that while they were walking down the street, looking down, texting on their phone, that now they can't see your website, very good. So, um, and then tablets was another consideration, right? Um, the use in tablets we're seeing on Dr. Anderson's audience from Google Analytics because we monitor all of the, uh, the traffic, right? Everybody monitors the traffic all to their site. Raise your hand if you don't, shame on you, <laughs> right? Um, and, and that's how we knew we had to prioritize this. E even off of this bad site, um, we were seeing where traffic was coming from. Uh, and we knew looking forward that we, we, if, if we, when we were successful in building his audience, they were gonna be, more people were going to come and they were gonna be coming on different devices. And, now, um, the website and its brand, those assets allowed us to um, create a social media platform for the doctor, right? So we were able to uh, repurpose a number of the pictures, a lot of the content we have, uh, even up here. Now we've got a good picture of the doctor instead of, you know, the, the one from the bookshop that was so nice to have. I'll tell you a quick story about the pictures. So um, I had gotten to the point we were waiting for pictures from, from the doctor to come in. And there was always a something else he had to do, something else to do. So I, uh, I sent my uh, photographer from Pittsburgh down to Annapolis with my assistant. Right? It was a photographer I've worked with for years. Uh, so uh, His name was Jack Wolf. So I had every confidence in him. But I sent my assistant down with a list. And I said, Hunter, don't come out without these pictures. Now, Hunter was I think, 22, 23 at the time. I sent him down to Annapolis. And they're going to the shoot with the doc. And the doc's got phone calls. And they're trying to put off the photographer. And I'm like, Hunter. Don't come home with these, these pictures. So I'm getting like frantic texts. And, the doctor has another meeting, but I'm going to get him to do that. And I'm down to three, and I'm down to two, and I just had the last one picture. So God bless his soul. He was like, he was not coming home without the pictures. So we ended up getting almost 400 pictures um, after the fact. So it was so nice to go from two to 400, and we had some assets to work with. And so those assets have been reapplied uh, to, to Dr. Anderson's page on a regular basis, and what we really wanted to demonstrate in his brand was his accessibility. Right? He wasn't a guy that we were putting up on the pedestal. 
he was down where everybody else is. Right? He he signs when he does a book signing. He stays till the very last person. You're like he's looking around the corner. Anybody else? No. Nope. Okay, now I can finally leave. And I see this time after time, and we see the engagement that he has of all the excited people who have used his content, and they're reacting. They want access to Dr. Anderson. And that was one of the things that we saw. He has great relationships. People wanted more access to him, so we gave them more access to him. Um, uh, I'll tell you one story. I was just in Anaheim for the uh, Take Shape for Life convention, and we're around taking pictures, and um, there was a gentleman there that uh, appears as if it was his wife, and, uh, and she was holding her small child. And I couldn't hear um, what they were talking about. Um, but I saw the gentleman, and uh, uh, he was probably uh, weighing in, it's probably still probably about 280, 300 pounds. Uh, and apparently, uh, you know, as they're having a the conversation, the guy just looked at, 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 uh, at Dr. Anderson, and he had said something, and both of these guys teared up. And uh, what I later found out was that the guy, uh, the, uh, the gentleman who had been reading the book had been diagnosed with, uh, from his doctors with severe heart disease and uh, his doctor had literally given him the, you have to lose 100 pounds or you're going to die. Uh, and the gentleman had made this trip to Anaheim to thank Dr. Anderson. And, uh, you know, we talk, you know, it's easy to talk about analytics and, you know, in the business size of all this, but we're talking about building engagement. And, I, and the engagement that I saw in there was very authentic. Right? And you can't, you can't capture that just for marketing Zevil's purposes, but when you can demonstrate that, that that's the type of guy that he is, that makes a change in the audience uh, and the opportunities that it creates. Right? So like your MS video, right? there are people, in, there's are real people in there dealing with real things. And, uh, and that's an <coughs> opportunity, but it's also a bit of a double-edged sword. If you misuse it, if it looks like you are taking advantage uh, of people, it will come back to bite you. Yeah. So we built out the rest of the Dr. Anderson social platform. Uh, and stop we, you right there? Yes. Because you made a good point. So how did you ensure then that you kept it down the middle line so that it didn't, you know, flow over into such a personal agenda? Well, because we're it's careful. very hard with these types of branding opportunities for individuals. Yeah, uh, it, it is. Um, so we do capture some of those moments, and, and you have to be um, you have to be diligent in the pictures that you show, right? Because um, like some of the early pictures I saw from events where they're hugging, um, one could interpret it as uh, inappropriate, right? If you didn't know the context, right? There's my married client um, with his arms around this woman, right? And it just some of those pictures um, just didn't capture it correctly. We never let those see the, the light of day, right? But when you have those uh, those exchanges and there's and you just have them look at each other and there's those some of those pictures that just communicate um, without having to say anything about them. Those are the pictures that we selected, and you have to balance it, you know, because you get too much hallmark momenty type of thing. Then I think that you you take away from the information, the education, the requirements that come from compliance. Um, um, so, it, so that's how we have to do it. You just you have to be, I think, tasteful, uh, and, and and look for the downside, right? Who's going to call you out as you're trying to exploit somebody? And you just don't want to ever get called out like that. And especially on social media, they'll they'll do it. So Tori asked me last night how we selected the social media for the doctor. Well, first of all, Facebook's a gimme, right? His target audience is uh, women 31 to 60, uh, and he already had a big population. Uh, a lot of his clients and a lot of their coaches were already on Facebook. They were using it for marketing. So Facebook was a gimme. All right. Now, we went to Google+. Plus. Anybody having success with Google+. Plus? Anybody not having success with Google+. Plus? I'm there with you. Right? Uh, so Google+. Plus or on Google+, Plus, yeah, it's kind of like, you know like when you have, uh, so, uh, you know when you throw a party, and you have like, and you, and you have like the big party room set up, and the, the food's in the back, and you have the music playing, but everybody ends up in your kitchen, right? And, you know, drinking, sitting on the, uh, well, maybe you don't throw the same types of parties as I do, uh, <laughs> but it's like you know, you can plan, and you can have all this functionality, you can have it all set up, but the conversation happens where the people are, right? So it doesn't matter that Google Plus has all this cool stuff, and that they're Google, and you can do this and you can do that. You know, we were seeing everybody was hanging out in the kitchen in Facebook. You know, so we have been there, and uh, we've got, uh, I'm sorry, this is on Twitter. Let me get to Google+. And we have been there, 
and we are there. Um, and, and there's something I'll, I'll tell you about this in a, in a little bit, but um, it was a compulsory because there's that mixed thing, right? So we don't have as many conversations as we would like to on Google+, but we have a crazy amount of traffic, which I'll talk to you about a bit. Um, and then also the fact that they're Google and, you know, and then, you know, you want the SEO, so Google kind of wink winks like, so you're going to have a Google Plus page, right? And uh, even though you don't want to, they're Google and, and they're saying, hey, you should have this and you should have that. We end up having a Google Plus page, right? Um, we have uh, our Twitter uh, page, a little different. Um, they're just, the community isn't uh, a real big Twitter community, but uh, we're trying to build this out. <laughs> and then there is uh, YouTube, which is great because uh, I have the doctor on video, right? Again, his strengths is his presentation, his passion, and how he's able to connect with an audience when my guy is live. So that is some of the best content. Unfortunately, with his schedule, it's very difficult to get him to do uh, video on a recurring basis, although we've got him doing some Google Hangouts and, and some things where people can actually interact with him. Is he back in clinical practice now? He is not. He is, uh, um, uh, he is more than busy with just what he's doing. Um, and he's making a difference, right? Which is going to talk about that. You know, what is that difference that he's making? Now, the extension of that, this brand, right? It wasn't just the cool logo. It wasn't just the website. It wasn't the social, just the social media. Because those are all compulsories. Right? Wouldn't you agree that they're kind of the, the things that you kind of have to do when you're building a brand new to try and create engagement? Right? So, but one of the other things that we thought, well, we have all this art and we have all these assets. What if we turned it into some marketing collateral? Right? You know, it's uh, like you get jazzed up about somebody like, oh, I wish I had a t-shirt. Right? So we made Dr. Anderson t-shirts. We made some uh, water bottles and uh, gym bags and some, some, uh, some trucker hats and just some other things just to see because we already had the assets. So if you've already made the investment um, in that type of content, how can you repurpose that to amortize your investment, right? What else could I do with this content? So we created a cafe press store. Anybody familiar with, uh, not familiar with cafe press? Okay, so cafe press lets you make your own t-shirts, right? Uploaded art, and you can get a one-off, right? As opposed to going to a local printer and I need 10,000 of these things and what am I going to do with the other 9,999 t-shirts? I only want one. Right, so we uploaded art files that we have, we created a storefront that matched his website, and we integrated it into the website. So those people who were such a fan, great, you want a Dr. A t-shirt? Get a t-shirt. You want a water bottle? Get a water bottle. And surprisingly, we moved a bunch of product. We also tied it to um, all, that all of the proceeds from this goes to health-related charities. So now I've got marketing collateral, which um, it's great when the, you know, the fans uh, want it. Uh, and, and I'll argue that it, it adds to the brand perception, right? If you've got a t-shirt with your name on it, you know, if so fact so, you might be a somebody, let alone water bottles and, and other types of uh, collateral. Uh, but the fact that we were able to tie this into uh, his charitable efforts to give back to the community, that he wasn't making a dime off of this stuff. Um, it, it, it just moved more product because people believed that they were supporting something. <laughs> yes, I wanted the cool t-shirt, and I didn't mind it was a little pricier because I knew all the money was going to a charity all along the way. So the only responsibility that we had is to make sure that we let people know where the checks were going on a regular basis so it wasn't just a, oh, they put it up there to move more product and we never heard about anything. So uh, that was some additional content that we have t-shirts, water bottles, whatnot, that we can use in marketing to remind his audience about why they were there, why they were interested in the subject matter in the first place, and have a little fun with it. So, Dr. A t-shirts, bags, water bottles were a big seller, and each of these was able to put a different um, message on it. So we had things with the Doc's logo on it, but there was also content um, we were able to take some other messages, right? Like I choose optimal health. So you may not want something that has a big giant Dr. A logo on it, but if you wanted to make a, a healthy statement, right? I choose optimal health, right? We had a lot of the uh, health coaches and a lot of clients who were choosing optimal health 
who love this bag, right? Hey, it's a little cotton bag, I can throw some stuff on it, it's cool and trendy, um, and uh, I'll be the first on my block to have one, right? And then we took his branding uh, and then applied it to this messaging. So again, those, the font that we had, the color schema uh, that we had developed, the EKG pulse, we are now applying this to different messages for the doc. So when it stands on its own, you know where it came from. That's the intent behind the design. Right. And then the water bottles were a big uh, hit. The Stop Challenge Choose actually came from a presentation that the doctor was doing where he was just trying to um, summarize uh, uh, one of his current books, uh, Discovery Optimum Health, where he challenged uh, uh, his audience to stop what you were doing, challenge yourself to do better, and choose health. Right? So that line just you know, kept clicking, and I'm like, you know, hey, I think there's a little something here with it. What if we did this, 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 and we use the fonts, and we use the color? So Stop, Challenge, Choose came from that, us trying to figure out, you know, uh, what else we could take from the doctor that he already had from a message standpoint, apply his branding to it, and then uh, productize it. So this would become um, not only a bit of a battle cry, but a very successful promotion for the doctor uh, in uh, Q3 of last year. And with all of this new branding and all this new website and all this social media stuff and the t-shirts in the bag and everything else, Dr. A was now cool, <laughs> right? Right. We got him to lighten up a little bit because this is Dr. Anderson, right? That first picture where he's just very stoic and just there, you know, that's great. You know, we're going to do the sculpture at him uh, on the, at the hospital, you know, after, he, after he's long passed, right? But this is Dr. Anderson. This is, this is who um, we're trying to represent and to get everybody to know more of. So it's not the typical doctor. Right? And uh, uh, that you, you've seen, but it's accessible, he's fun, and at the right moments, we share this type of content. Now, I can't come out with this stuff every day, uh, or what's gonna happen. If I show up with like happy like selfies, and I'm on a boat, and everything else types of stuff, how are you gonna perceive my good doctor? Cheesy. Yeah. Cheesy, right? Cheesy guys. But, if I crack this out 5% of the time, how are you gonna perceive my doctor? Accessible. Accessible. Fun. That's what I want. Because again, I see that relationship with the people. They want more of him. I need to make him seem like he's accessible. So selecting the right types of content helps you achieve your goals. Right? And that's what we did with the doc. So now, what is your impression of Dr. Anderson with the repackaging and everything you've seen now? So we hold up like the eights and the nines and the tens, <laughs> right? So, how did we do? Good, bad, eh? Oh, great. Great, I'll take great, thank you. Much better. Yeah. That's much better. How did this guy ever think he was going to be an anesthesiologist? I'm sorry? How did this guy ever think he was going to be an anesthesiologist? Well, just so it, it, he was really more in critical care, was, was, his, was, his, it was his big focus. Okay. So it's in trying to, how do, you, how do you position him to be a voice that people listen to? Right? And as opposed to being one doctor at a hospital who's only able to impact so many people, now he's a doctor not at a hospital that's able to impact more people. Right? But we had to create that platform for him, and uh, we had to make sure that he looked like a guy you would listen to. Right? Well, so you gave him credibility, yeah. which he didn't really have before. So how do you, how do you feel like he got credibility? Experience and, and credential, if you will, which is thoroughly legitimate. Um, you know, he was able to turn that around and market it such that, with some help, um, rebrand himself as a physician um, and go from local to national with a great deal of credibility and following. Um, you know, you did make him accessible, but if, if he doesn't walk the talk, he's going to wind up dying awfully fast, particularly in the marketplace 
um, and social being what it is. So um, if I were Dr. Anderson, um, I really would um, watch and probably be a, a control freak about um, what, what was uh, created for me or what I wrote to, to put out there. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll probably go into this uh, a little more, but that to me is, I took exception with that early on, thinking that, uh, you know, kind of almost charlatany. Um, and and uh, looking for um, you know a, a sizable paycheck, frankly, but um, I don't know him. If uh, if he's that genuine, and there are so many doctors now in the public space, as we know, on television, they have television shows, um, radio shows, on and on and on, and and we do respect them, and they and they are credible in that space. So if, if he and you are delivering, so much the better. Hopefully we have some more healthy people out there. Other thoughts? No, I mean, I'm okay with that. I, I think that it, it did, it's an evolution. It has to evolve. But I guess the thing for me was that I'm thinking if I'm that patient and I'm wanting to care, but I guess I think based on what you showed, I didn't see where you were really putting a lot of his credibility as credentialing out there. Well, thank really you, because it's a very nice setup for my next section. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, um, I, you know, to really, I don't because, know. yeah, because I'm thinking as an anesthesiology, what gives you any credibility right. to tell me how to lose weight? I, I mean, right. that's, that's what exactly. my thought would be. And then, you know, I just think second to that, it's sort of that balance and that mix between the fun, down-to-earth guy, but really taking the serious, because this is a serious illness that impact. well, it, it, yeah, I think they're calling obesity a disease now, aren't they? Yeah, no. yep. But that really impacts a lot of people, so I think the playful realm is not bad, and to feel that engagement and be amongst the people, but then to have that level where he still has to be the expert and authority. Right. That's all, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I completely agree with your point. But from a process standpoint, I had to package my guy up before I can take him to market. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's where we're on the first step is uh, is creating that perception. And as Tori said um, very quickly, if we don't follow through, if we don't walk the the, the walk, uh, then the, it, it will fall very quickly. Yeah. Because I, I think yeah. if I can just add. That part's the ugly part, in all honesty. And I think a lot of people feel uncomfortable with, with, with doing that, with the rebranding part of it. Um, you know, but we get past that very quickly when, uh, in fact, at the, at the end of that road, we do have something um, that, that is a value and, and does show credibility in earnest. Um, you know, because there are all sorts of checks and balances out there that were not five years ago, ten years ago, but now you really can't get around um, that credibility issue in the marketplace and the, and the transparency that, that people are seeking, certainly patients. So I would just add that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, comment just would say, too, part of, and I agree with you, this is sort of the, the, the very part of the process, but there's a critical mass that has to be achieved, and his marketing is happening while it's packaged, is happening with every one of those people that attend those conferences. And at this point in his game, that's where his promotion is really, really happening. And giving places for them to communicate their passion about how they feel about him is the only way to get to the next level because um, without that, he would just be more than 100,000. Yeah. Yeah. Susie said he was great, gave me a hug. Oh, look, there's pictures of him all over her Facebook page. That's easy to get to from his Facebook page. The content's there for them to share. Now he's getting some, he's breaking that. Thank you. So let's get to the next step then. So the results of this, well, first of all, we have the, the uh, as you say, we have the tools required to take him to market. Before he didn't have the tools, uh, these tools are required, he now has them. Uh, we're presenting a comprehensive brand, and we've packaged Dr. Wayne Anderson now for more things to come. We've positioned him as a national personality. Um, here on some of the analytics, we've got a 4x increase on his website traffic from the, you know, which admittedly, um, wasn't hard to be his old site, right? But we do pay attention to the metrics um, because those are, you know, that quantitative is, is important. Everybody can feel better about it, but someone wants to know uh, how we're doing and we need to be able to prove that. Uh, and then we increased the number of media inquiries. He got, he got asked to the dance 
a lot more after the fact than he did before the fact. Okay. So our lessons learned on this, um, for your takeaway, start with good content, right? Start with, and, and content is in, in quotes, <laughs> start with the good pictures. Um, pictures are the, uh, the most shared content on social media. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if they say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, what's a great video clip worth, right? You know, somebody did the math, and obviously it's a lot more. Um, but uh, uh, the, the logos, uh, the website, um, uh, the content that you share out, make sure it is serving your goal. Make sure that it's bringing you closer to your goal, not driving you farther away from your goals. And I think that's a good metric from what are we going to use. Packaging is imperative. Um, no matter which market are, you know, people are still consumers, and uh, we react to the superficial. It's pretty. It's not pretty. I like it. I don't like it. Um, and there's immediate uh, evaluation based on the, uh, that, you know, that, those first couple of se uh, seconds where you take a look at something. Uh, you know, we see the same thing in packaging. I, you know, uh, I'm interested in this package. I'm not interested. I believe it, uh, the claims uh, from this ad. I don't believe the claims from this ad. Right? And then amortize your investment. One of the things that we found that you know, when we were working on the website, that it generated a lot of other assets that we could use for social media, for email, for marketing, for events. Um, budgets are, have always been tight. They tend to get tighter. Uh, and uh, uh, this is one of the ways that we were able to um, justify investments in a photo shoot, in doing video, because we were able to apply it to a number of things. It made sense. Uh, and then have a plan. Uh, you just can't go and just start chopping wood, right? So where there's chips flying, it looks like you're doing things, uh, but at the end of the month, they're going to say, so how did we do this month? Uh, and without a plan, you're not going to be able to reach those goals and obviously measure your success. Um, it seems to be um, a lot of the things that we already know, uh, but isn't it amazing how many of these steps so that we find our team or our efforts skipping uh, and being able to justify it for a reason. Oh, we'll just do it this one time. Oh, we'll just do this now. We'll figure it out later. Particularly on the, uh, the measurement, uh, I stress in identifying those goals and those metrics in advance because people have selective memory after the fact. Right? It's like, oh, you know, we did really great. Well, that really wasn't a goal. Well, yes, it was a goal. Well, you said in that meeting, write them down, say these are our goals, these are, and this is uh, how we're going to measure our success. It makes it much easier after the fact. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So now creating engagement, right? Starting a conversation to generate the ROI. So the packaging and the smoke and mirrors and all that stuff is great, um, but we need to generate conversations, right? Just like most of your companies do, uh, uh, all sales start with a conversation. So how are we going to generate a conversation? Well, first we get our doc in front on, on, on a much better stage than he has been. All right. We capture those moments of the doc, and we capture images of the conversations that he has. All right. And then we develop additional content to generate conversations without the doc having to be there. All right. We did prescriptions for optimal health. All right. The um, all too familiar uh, doctor's pad, uh, prescription pad, and we even played with some really hard to read typefaces at first, just because it mm -hmm. again it was. You know, kind of uh, you know, making fun of that. I can't read your handwriting. You're a doctor, um, but the, strangely enough, we found people like were committed. It's almost like figuring out a puzzle. Like, what the hell did he write, right? So we ha we were still getting shares. Um, we came through uh, a little more of a uh, uh, a medium, and you know, kind of came off to uh, to this typeface. Um, we were also able to take some little what we call our happy thought images, right? And again, there was brainy pictures that primarily found their way on the social media. Sometimes they found it on the website, sometimes they found it in the emails. But we shared thoughts that the doc wanted to share, right? And, and each of these resonated with somebody else in the audience, right? And when you're on Facebook and you see the little happy thought what do you, that resonates with you, what do you do? You like, it. you like it. And then what do you do if it really resonates with you or makes you think of somebody? Share. You share it. Right, and that's what this stuff does. It gets crazy likes and crazy shares. So, um, the, the next thing we did to, to build engagement is we took Dr. Anderson's book and we reverse engineered it into a 30, a 60, and a 90-day email program. 
So it was the content that had literally been sitting on the shelf for six years that we wanted to try and get people to engage with. Because it was still good content. He was meeting new people. They hadn't seen it yet. So what do we do with it? Instead of just the, oh, buy my book. Trust me, there'll be good stuff inside the book. Buy my book. Well, we demonstrated his expertise. So we created a free email program. And at the end of the email program, you got a certificate suitable for framing that demonstrated that you completed this step in success. Right? And then after our success of 11,000 people in two weeks that signed up for this program, you do the press release. Right? Because that's the next type of content. Hey, we had a home run. Let's tell everybody we had a home run. Sent the press release out of PR Newswire. Paid the extra money for the multimedia fixture to get that picture shown up on the Jumbotron in Times Square. Right? And then I get the picture of my guy on the Jumbotron in Times Square, which I immediately place on Facebook and Google+. Plus. Why? What does this say about my guy? He's legit. He's it. Right? He made it to Times Square. Right? He was on that little stage earlier. Now my guy's on Times Square. Right? And we can have a little fun with this image. Right? The total investment, I think, on the PR portion of this was, uh, I don't know, 2500 bucks. But that picture, I'd have paid 2500 bucks just for that picture to show my guy as the national guy in Times Square. Right? Content marketing. So he came out with a new book. We got more pictures of him being happy with other people, right? And then because people were taking all the selfies, we're like, well, let's try and grab up all these happy selfies. We created a, uh, a Facebook promotion where you could add new copies of the book. Now, all this seemed to be going really great, but we weren't getting engagement on the website, right? So we got into more content. We now develop weekly articles for the doctor, working with him, of course, um, to um, help keep the conversation going about what's important and generate new conversations about new things that come out. So for instance, we had uh, this that came out a couple weeks ago, Why Walk? Three Reasons to Get Out and Start Walking. On his website, we got 842 likes on his website, which if you post, uh, add posts to your website, uh, you might think that that's pretty good metrics. It's very good for uh, Dr. Anderson, who gets anywhere between 600 and 1,000 likes on his website. This all starts with social media. This is an example of the post uh, we did on social media uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, here's what, September 9th. So 238 shares, 200-ish comments. Is that engagement? Right, that's what we're trying to do. So we monitor, we monitor this over time. Right? And we find at the beginning of every week when we share these posts that we get engagement. Right? We get dramatic engagement. Or on, this is on <coughs> Facebook. We had uh, almost 38,000 people with organic reach off of one. Uh, we monitor this over the course of the year. And we can see we get spikes when we post new content. So we know this content works. Right? We take that content and we turn it into emails. Because sometimes you didn't see it on Facebook. Uh, we want to make sure that the, e the, the people on the email list see it. We're monitoring the click-through rates, which we're getting pretty decent rates, um, particularly against uh, averages. Uh, list average in it for health and fitness is 17.1%. We've got 28%. We take that content and we repurpose it in other areas that we're trying to start conversations, like LinkedIn. Right? We found um, that there are uh, a lot of professionals on uh, Dr. Uh, in LinkedIn that Dr. Anderson uh, is interested in starting conversations with and they with he. So we were able to get him a contributing author spot. We repurposed his content, uh, which reflects well on his page. And this particular post got more than 3,000 views, 3,600 views on LinkedIn, which isn't a social media site that you think would be a great performer. When did you wrap LinkedIn to the plan? Why? When? When? Uh, it was from the very beginning, which is underutilized. Okay. We created a profile for him because it was part of the vetting process, right? That's most why people are on LinkedIn. Hey, we're going to check, out, check you out. I'm going to go check out your LinkedIn profile. Number of connections, what do you write, you know, what have you done, uh, all that. But we were able to get him onto a contributing other, uh, author spot, which now I'm able to demonstrate that he's a subject matter expert. It's one thing that I say that he's great. It's another thing that I demonstrate that he's great. And I think that's what content marketing needs to do. It's really to demonstrate uh, your message. Um, one of the things that uh, we've, it's been able to do is um, on Google Plus, 
The good doctor has 62,000 followers, but has seen, has received more than 32 million views. Comparatively, Dr. Oz has 733,000 followers, but only 7 million views. So we have less people engaging more with our doctor than Dr. Oz's team has with his. And all of this is against the plan. All of this it maps out everything that we're doing, you know, all the tools that we have over the course of the month and what we're doing each day. And then you think that's what it takes to really, if you're gonna do content marketing, this is the plan that we were talking about. So our big lessons from this is content, content development is an investment, right? And you have to identify your ROI in advance, right? And that's the, the quantitative is the easy part. The qualitative is much more difficult, right? Saying that, you know, they like Dr. Anderson more than they used to. Um, isn't just uh, Facebook numeric, right? There's that, uh, that, that sentiment factor that's very difficult uh, to, um, uh, to identify. And, and, and knowing where your audience is, I think that's another big lesson, uh, lesson learned. We tried some other properties. You know, I think there's a Quora property. We tried Instagram. Audience isn't there. So you have to try them, right? You have to make educated uh, investments on where you think you can reach your audience um, but then you also have to new want to cut your losses, right? Engagement means that there's a conversation on those properties. We weren't getting any kind of conversation. You get some likes and you get a couple shares, but it wasn't like Facebook when people are saying, Dr. A, today I did this and I did that and I did these other things. So what do you think about that? That's engagement. How right? long, Kevin, can I ask, did you give them before you decided to kill it? Um, I think Instagram, you know, we started out you know, keeping that equal, and then we, after three months, we cut it back because it wasn't doing anything, and after three months now, um, you know, we, we share some, like, the happy thought pictures, just because that content works well on there, uh, but we don't do anything else, and we don't even, we don't even see that much engagement, right? Um, and and the, the, I, I want to stress that fourth point. Engagement means there's a conversation, right? Um, you just, like, so marketing is just, like, it's like spamming people. It's like, I'm going to send you this, I'm going to send you this, I'm going to send you this. It's a broadcaster's tool, right? Um, uh, engagement is in broadcasting, right? God, engagement is um, uh, you say something, they say something, right? Or we do something, they do something. Um, and, and I think that's the hardest part is to get people to act. And it's different than the traditional call to action, right? Call, click, stop in. Um, particularly in social media. And I don't want to just limit the conversation to social media. But um, what they see at the website about that engagement demonstrates what is acceptable, uh, the doctor's accessibility, um, what they can expect. When they show up at events, the doctor performs just like they see on his website. So we have that continuity in the brand and the continuity in the messaging. As advertised, that guy will come up and give you a hug, right? And he will stay there and sign your book, and he will take selfies uh, uh, with you, as many as you need to take, uh, with, because your husband doesn't know how to use your phone, uh, and, uh, and he's just that guy, right? And that's, that's how we're engaging that audience. On every type of communication that we use, we are trying to engage the audience. Um, and we're trying to make it easier for them to participate, right? I, you know, I find people are inherently lazy, right? Unless there's something directly in it for them and they're really motivated, they won't do something that you ask them to do. But when they feel passion, they feel that connection, Right? There's, there's always you know, a like, and there's a comment, and there's a share. I think that's the metric of how am I doing this? How are they really uh, getting engaged? So I'll, wait, I'll, I'll wrap up here because I know we've got for time. It was a question that we had. Uh, I asked the doctor uh, yesterday. I said, Doc, I said, I'm presenting a case study. I said, what do you want to say? He, and he says, well, you know, let him know that the first step in my program was developing my brand and the communication platform to support it all, the website, social media, et cetera, and others. The second step was in learning how to use my brand and platform to communicate with my different audiences. And I want to emphasize the different audiences, right? Because uh, a, a first-time mom is different than a grandmother. Uh, it is different than uh, a, a guy in his mid-40s, right? You know, the language they use, the what motivates them uh, is different. The... Um, how you connect with them is going to be different for a number of different reasons. Um, um, so we're very cognizant of the different audiences uh, and uh, their preferences and styles in communicating. This isn't a set it and forget it. This isn't a, ah, oh, everybody will take something different from the one thing. We change these messages up. We use the different visuals um, so that people feel like they're really connecting, just like they were there 
with a good doctor. So today, he reaches more people than ever before, and that's his real value. That's how the doc is getting his ROI. Questions? Yes? Uh, I'm curious about the Google Plus, like that engagement. It is really unusual like, to see that many page views relative to numbers. Like, are there particular things you're doing there that, that generate them? Yeah, um, those, uh, the thought of the days and those prescriptions, are that content kills it. Um, because people just like that, you know, that, uh, that low investment, right? You're like, oh, that's cool, click, right? And it's almost a bit of a habit on, on social. Uh, and then we find a lot of people share those with people and they'll add their own two cents, right? So that, that stuff is probably, you know, hands down going to be the, the, the greatest ROI because we bang out like 20 of those things, in a, you know, in a couple of hours. You know, there's a list of happy thoughts, you know, get some stock images, bang, bang, bang. Well, I've got content for a month. So my investment is very small, but the sharing on that, particularly because it's Facebook, you know, and, uh, uh, and uh, we share them out on LinkedIn, uh, the Google+. Plus. Uh, we'll post them out on Twitter as well. Just Twitter hasn't been, his audience isn't a total Twitter. They tend to right. skew a little older. Um, but that's the stuff that they really resonate with um, that I think has made such a big difference. Yes. What? How big is the staff to support Dr. Anderson? Uh, so it's uh, Dr. Anderson, his wife, Lori. Uh, he has uh, an assistant uh, and an executive assistant. And then that's it. And then he has our team. So um, we are the, the communication, I serve as his communications director, and we, uh, we've been with him for three and a half years now, um, and uh, we really kind of run the show. We have our check-ins and, and whatnot, but he's really delegated so much of that to us, and over time, um, uh, we have become uh, the bit of the uh, MLR for the doctor, right, or compliance, right? I, I know, and a writer that I have, have had working on this for two years, we know what sounds like the doc, what doesn't sound like the doc, right? We did an e-book for him, uh, you know, which was uh, 122 pages. We developed new models for him. Um, we help him develop this weekly content. So we really are subject matter experts <coughs> on behalf of the doctor. Okay. Other questions, comments? Yes, in the back. Were there any thoughts around success stories, testimonials, bringing that into the content? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there was. And I know we're fighting for time, but I'll, I'll show you. We moved that into a, a program uh, called Stop Challenge Choose where we build out a website after his book, go faster, go faster, and this promotional website uses these success stories. These were four of 10 uh, that we used, uh, and, we, and they were very authentic. And actually, in the sense that the user submitted them uh, as part, so there was their pictures and their words. We did a couple editing, a little editing just to make sure that they, they presented well, um, but it's stories from their own, which has just generated more and more interest and then we use this content from uh, their stories on this website for Facebook ads. And we took the demographics of the testimonial, matched it to the demographics of the target ads, and we're killing it on Facebook ads. I mean, I think we've converted, I want to say 10,000 since uh, August 1, based off the fa uh, Facebook ads. So we've had more than 10,000 people sign up for this program since then, and I think the spend is like seven grand. On it, you know, I mean, on some, on some of these demographics, like women uh, 31 to 46, I'm getting like 30 cents a, a conversion, which you can't. So the content we've repurposed the content, so it's user generated content that we've repurposed now into advertising that drives more traffic. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks, everybody. You'll be here for lunch, correct? I will be here through the course of the day. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay. How's it going? Sorry, I'm not doing great, man.